Good afternoon. My name is Emmett McGrory, and on behalf of the Institute for Human Ecology, welcome to the Catholic University of America. The Institute is a university's interdisciplinary facility and is dedicated to understanding and propagating the conditions vital for human flourishing. Through scholarship and public engagement, uh, we challenge those theories and practices that denigrate the nature of the person and thereby thwart the pursuit of freedom and prosperity for all. Today we'll be discussing the administrative state and how it squares with the Constitution and with our notions of freedom. We have two great panelists with us today. Anthony Campau is visiting fellow in regulatory policy at the Thomas A. Rowe Institute for Economic Policy Studies at the Heritage Foundation, which I like to think of as the, the Dean of Public Policy Institutes working to advance the cause of liberty. Anthony's prior experience includes clerking for Judge Rao at the Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, serving as Chief of Staff and Counselor for the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at OMB, and serving on the regulatory reform team on the Trump presidential transition team. Anthony earned a JD and LLM in securities and financial regulation from Georgetown University Law Center and a Bachelor of Arts in History from Southeastern University. We also have with us today, Kara Rollins. Uh, she is litigation counsel at the New Civil Liberties Alliance. NCLA is a nonpartisan, nonprofit civil rights group with the mission to protect constitutional freedom from violation by the administrative state. It was founded by the eminent legal scholar, Philip Hamburger. Before joining NCLA, Kara was counsel for Cause of Action Institute and clerked in the Superior Court of New Jersey. Kara graduated with honors from Rutgers University with a BA in political science and is a cum laude graduate of the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law, where she was a member of the Law Review and Moot Court team. Anthony, welcome to the Catholic University of America. And Kara, welcome back. Thank you. Be here. So I'll just give a, a short sort of description of the administrative state. You know, we can break down the administrative state into two general matters. One would be the size and subject matter scope of the federal and state bureaucracies. And the second is how its structure squares with the Constitution and the liberty interests of the citizen. Today, we're going to focus on the latter set of issues. So why is this such a big issue, this conflict between liberty and the administrative state? Well, the history of that goes back to the late 1800s. Enthused with the progress of science, progressives began advocating for a robust bureaucracy staffed with experts trained in what they called the new science of administration. They contended that such experts could take the politics out of government administration. By applying scientific methods, they could figure out what the best decisions were for society and there would be no controversy. That is, once Americans were properly trained. To accomplish this, though, two changes were necessary. First, the citizen would have to be conditioned to, to defer the shaping of society through expert rule rather than directing it through their legislature. Uh, that is, we would lose some of the luster of citizen-directed government. And second, the experts would need sufficient authority. Power would have to be shifted, at least in a practical matter, from the states to the federal government and, the, and from Congress to the judiciary Oh, I'm sorry, from Congress and the judiciary to the executive branch, and once there, insulated in varying degrees from political control. So uh, uh, early uh, influential, influential proponent of, of this um, was Woodrow Wilson. In an 1880 1887 essay entitled The Study of Administration, he argued that politics and bureaucracy, what he called administration, were distinct endeavors. Bureaucracy, at most points, he said, stands apart even from the debatable ground of constitutional study. It lies outside the proper sphere of politics and should be removed from the political life of the people. 
the bureaucrat should have and does have a will of his own and the choice of means for accomplishing his work. In support of these points, he argued that it's a misconception that administration stands on a different basis in a democratic state from that on which it stands in a non-democratic state. The concentration of power in the executive branch has spawned some broad areas of controversy, including whether specific legislation is so broad or vague in its grant of authority to the executive branch that it violates the Constitution's vesting of the duty and power to legislate solely in Congress. Where the courts improperly defer to an agency's interpretation of an ambiguous statute, regulation, or agency action, thus violating their duty to interpret the law. Where the Congress has undermined the president's constitutional duty to faithfully execute the laws by limiting his authority in certain instances to fire appointees. And procedural rights concerning the promulgation of administrative rules and the conduct of administrative hearings and the appeals from those hearings. And uh, last but not least, least, the executive branch's interference with the structure and functioning of state government by attaching improper procedures to federal grants and aids to the states that specify how a state is to consider and accept a federal grant offer. Well, with that rundown, uh, I think let's, let's begin the discussion today with some of the cases that arose as a result of administrative restrictions on houses of worship. So in reaction to COVID, several states, including California and New York, issued restrictions on public gatherings, including on houses of worship. Agudath Israel in the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn brought suit seeking relief from uh, the governor of New York's executive order, and the Supreme Court granted interim relief in November. Uh, and that is, I would say, kind of capped off, uh, at least so far, uh, a whole slew of cases on this issue. So Kara, could, could you walk us through this case or this group of cases? Sure. So I, I, the first case that actually got up to the Supreme Court, if I'm recalling correctly, is a case by the name of South Bay Pentecostal. Um, that's a case stemming from California, and it had the same issue. It was, it was an emergency um, relief based on seeking an injunction um, to allow worship practices to continue. Um, at the time, California had shut down or severely restricted access to houses of worship. Um, this was happening kind of across the country, if I recall. Those challenges went up in April, May. So we're talking the very, very beginning of the pandemic. Um, there are some additional challenges that went up over the summer. Um, one of them comes to mind in blanking on the name. It's the case at Nevada where essentially and, and this is where the, you start seeing the shift amongst the dissenters of saying, well, Nevada is allowing us to play craps, but they're not allowing us in houses of worship. And um, there's a famous, infamous church, if you will, um, that had started actually doing practice inside of a casino. And that's okay under Nevada law, but you cannot do it inside of an actual church facility. So that's sort of where things were going. Um, and then, when the newest case went up, and it's Agatha Israel and also the Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, um, looking at the structure of the way the state of New York has done their COVID restrictions, they use, I want to call it a temperature map, a heat map. It's, it's sort of based on what percentage of uh, an increases in COVID uh, positivity you're seeing over time, what are the rates, and allowing, in some extent, the idea is to get more localized um, adjustments to COVID restrictions. So, you know, especially when the complaints in New York at the beginning was, if you were in upstate New York and you weren't seeing issues, why are you subject to the same restrictions that you're seeing in, say, Manhattan or the Bronx, which had exploding numbers of cases? Um, what ended up happening is, is that you started to see, whereas at the beginning, of the pandemic, and I think this is some of the language that you see in the concurrence on South Bay, is the restrictions on houses of worship were very similar to the restrictions on secular practices. In many cases, everything was shut down, or it was a 25% shutdown or 25% capacity. Um, what you've started seeing now is the pandemic has gone into its eighth, ninth month, is that there's a lot of inconsistency, even within a given state, about what is okay behavior, what is not. 
And that's one of the challenges that was brought up in the Agatha Israel and Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn case that where they were situated, they were stopped from worship or severely limited in worship, but you can go indoor dining. You can go to Home Depot with no limit limitations. And the question then becomes, is this on its face or in practice discriminatory against religion? And the court ultimately said yes. Um, and I think that's one of the things, it was a per curiam uh, decision. A lot of folks, I think initially their inclination to say, well, the makeup of the court has changed in South Bay. So obviously it will come out this way because as you can all recall during Amy Coney Barrett's um, confirmation hearings, there was a lot of discussion in fact that she is Catholic. She taught at a Catholic institution. Um, she would have pro-religious bias, those sorts of things. And I think a lot of people want to look at these cases against Governor Cuomo and say, well, it's really a product of the fact that the makeup of the court has changed. And I'm not fully convinced of that. I think it has a lot to do with where we are at this stage of the pandemic, the restrictions that were in place and the restrictions that were being challenged. And as I said before, what you saw in the very beginning was that these limitations were sort of universally done. You know, you couldn't go sit down and eat and you couldn't go sit and pray. Um, what has happened over time is we've seen the stratification of, well, you can have a beer inside at a table, but you cannot go and worship. And I think the court is now a little bit more sensitive to that issue. Um, and I don't think it necessarily existed in the very beginning um, of these cases. So I don't think it's fully attributable to the change in the makeup of the court, as many commentators have suggested, so much as a change in the way the COVID protocols or the COVID restrictions have rolled out over time. Well, An Anthony, uh, can you give us your thoughts? Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville warned about the centralization of government and its effect on what he referred to uh, as the spirit of the republic. And he argued that a, a centralized bureaucracy render, renders the employment of free will less useful and more rare. It confines the action of the will in a smaller space and little by little steals the very use of free will from each citizen. So could you reflect on that in terms of today's administrative state? Are, are we at that point now? Thanks, Emmett. Um, just want to say thanks to you for hosting this and to the Institute. Kara, it's great to be uh, here and with all of the attendees uh, for this discussion. I think this is really important. Um, and Emmett, I'm glad you, uh, you, you asked me about the Tocqueville. I love the Tocqueville. And, uh, and I, I think that he, um, you know, he warned us about the concentration of administrative, uh, sort of legislative and executive power, if you will, right, uh, in one body. And that is, we do have that to a significant degree today. Um, and uh, I think that we are in a, we are in a, getting close to what you talked about, right? You, we are getting uh, to a place that's very concerning, but I don't think, uh, you know, all is lost or anything, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. I think there's a lot of work to be done, uh, which is part of what we're talking about here today. Um, uh, but I think there's plenty of cause for uh, 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 hope. There's a lot of reason to, to, to hope and be optimistic. There's a, there's a lot of progress has been made over the last few years. Um, and I think that there's going to be sort of a, an awakening uh, out there uh, about this uh, threat, this challenge, and uh, people are going to continue to dig in and figure out how to deal with it. And that's, you know, hopefully we, we could discuss a little bit today. I mean, I think, you know, Emmett, as I was thinking about this uh, discussion today, um, I was going back to the Institute's website and reviewing some of the history, and there's, there's great discussion there about how, um, uh, the Institute is focused on, you know, what is real, what is true, uh, without understanding what is real and true. The website says even the most laudable efforts to help others become disconnected from what actually helps. And I just think that's so uh, appropriate. You know, so much of the administrative state, I think when people think of the administrative state, they usually think about red tape for businesses, or maybe they think about economic analysis or deference doctrines. You know, it seems to be like a category of discussion and activity that's off on the side for, you know, lawyers in Washington. But it's really, um, 
you know, it's really all aspects of public policy and, and you know, to a significant degree, life in America. M many, you know, uh, human endeavors are covered in some, some fashion or in often multiple fashions by, you know, the executive branch, by the administrative state. I mean, this discussion so far has been about, you know, houses of worship, COVID, I mean, all, you know, all kinds of things that we don't typically think of as being, you know, the province of, you know, administrative law, we think about, you know, again, lots of the discussion in the, you know, the community here in DC is, uh, you know, on deference doctrines, Chevron, our seminal rock, it's, it's on economic analysis, and all that's good and important. Um, but I think uh, those are, those are kind of figuring out how agencies exercise discretion they're given from Congress, what are the best tools to use, and then, you know, what is article what do Article Three courts do in terms of, you know, second, you know, taking another look at the actions of the executive branch? But really, I think it's important for for everyone, you know, especially I think for, you know, young folks on the line who might be thinking about, you know, what to do with their careers in the future, things like that. Really digging in to what is the administrative state, how does it operate, um, what are some ways that you can contribute? I think is really important. Um, because uh, again, it really, if you just think about any policy area you care about, uh, almost certainly the administrative state is a key, of, uh, uh, you know, thing to understand to figure out how to achieve the policy goals that you have. So we often focus on, you know, bills we want to pass in Congress or how the court looks at this or that issue. But a key, key question is, you know, well, what discretion does the agency have to write a rule? How do they, how do you actually draft the rule? What do you need to have marshaled to, to develop a rule that is going to uh, stand, uh, you know, stand up in, in uh, an article three court, right? Um, and so uh, I'm glad that, that we're having this discussion. Uh, it's really, it really is so important to, to increase understanding of, um, of the role of the executive branch and what we can do to kind of make it the proper role that, that you know the founders intended. That's one of the things I like about the NCLA briefs. I mean, they 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 really drive home um, the effect that the administrative state has on the relationship between the citizen and government. And in a lot of respects, that that relationship has been turned on its head. And I, I think we'll see that in in. The, the next case we discuss, um, but it, 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 more than, than just a, a discussion of, of theory, um, it very much involves the, the individual. And in, in that, I'll, I'll note that as the, as the breadth and power of the administrative state has increased, almost along with it, we've seen an increase in alienation of, of the people from their government. So back in 1958, public, um, public surveys showed that about three quarters of Americans um, were, were, had, had, a, had a good, good view of, of the government um, and had a certain attachment to the government. And, and that was about the time that the administrative state really started growing in size and power. At the same time that that confidence in government started decreasing, um, and and now um, from a, about 2014 we hit the low mark of about 17 percent confidence in government, um, and and this these are across multiple surveys, um, so it really is a, a dramatic change in the way people look at government. I think it, it used to be that that people looked at government as their creation, uh, something that they directed. Now it's flipped around. Government it tends to look at, at people as, as the thing that they're gonna manage. And, and, um, and so it, obviously these trends can't continue and they have to be reversed. Um, in talking about the administrative state, as you alluded to, Anthony, a lot of times you hear the discussion in, in terms of well, the, the powers of this branch of government versus the powers of that branch of government and the interest of, of federal versus state um, and, and things like that. But, but 
there's a there's a bigger picture, and and that's the uh, how it affects the the citizen. Um, and one of uh, Tocqueville's point was that when when citizen is, when when government's uh, citizen directed, that also um, lends itself toward toward cohesion among the citizenry. Why? Because you're working with people on this common project. Uh, and his concern was that if if that dynamic was removed, you'd have an increase in in not only alienation with government, but but lack of cohesion uh, within the populace. And I think we're, we're clearly seeing that today. Emmett, I, I'd say on that point, I mean, you know, you mentioned the alienation of people from government. You know, one of the, the key statutes that's designed to help people to be connected to the government, to be able to participate in the process of developing standards is the Administrative Procedure Act, right? It's been on the books for 75 years. Uh, and the idea is to uh, help the governed understand, you know, propose new standards and be able to participate and have a conversation with the executive branch about the character and nature and parameters of those standards um, and to, to help them figure out what's best. And, uh, and, you know, I think to a significant degree over the last, you know, increasingly over the last, you know, couple of decades and decade in particular, you know, you've seen a lot of departures from that, right? You've seen a lot of uh, sort of quasi regulatory activity, you know, of various forms. You've got sort of guidance, a whole universe of guidance activity, right? Regulating through guidance you have um, through settlement agreements, all, all kinds of, of uh, mechanisms for basically setting policy that are outside that sort of standard APA process. Um, which, you know, I think is, there's a lot of great, great, great stuff about the APA that helps people to feel bought in and actually be, you know, able to contribute meaningfully. Um, and, 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 you know, unfortunately, to a significant degree, we've gotten away from that. Um, and there have been many efforts. I know NCLA has done a lot of work on this front to try to push, push more activity. And, and certainly one of the things I worked on a lot uh, in government was to try to push more activity into the ordinary process. Uh, because we think that is one way to get at this issue uh, that you've you've identified as being a problem. And I think we need to see more of that. I think there is a there is a lot of consensus out there actually on the need to do that, um, uh, even across the philosophical spectrum. So hopefully we'll see more of that activity in the future. Kira is. is uh, should we do a quick sound check? I was I was going to say no. We're not having. Any luck now? <laughs> okay, we can hear you fine now. Okay. I, um, I apologize for that. That's two pairs of earbuds that are now uh, going in the trash. I, I did, you know, as I'm listening to Anthony discuss um, some of the ideas, I want to go back to Emmett, your original sort of, you know, the two ways to look at the administrative state, their size and structure. Um, and I don't think that those two issues are actually a separate um, as maybe your intro said, I think that they tend to feed each other. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we talk about at NCLA, and it's again building on things that Anthony talked about, is sort of the explosive size of government, right? All the ways that the executive branch agencies act outside the scope of their legislative authority, um, guidance documents and you know, consent decrees and all these other sort of quasi, they're rules and you must follow them, but they're not really rules. Um, and that creates not only inconsistency in terms of enforcement, um, but it also creates, I think, stress on regulated parties, right? They don't really know what they should be doing. They don't know when they break the law. Um, that's one of the things that we at NCLA focus on is that, you know, the administrative state and the way it's currently composed and the way it currently behaves seriously impacts due process rights. I mean, it does it in a couple of ways, but certainly the ability to know that you violated the law is a preeminent concern. Um, and I think that going back to the difference between the size and structure, I think that the size issue is state and federal administrative size has grown, that that's implicated structural issues and vice versa. Suddenly, oh, well, there's, these agencies are so big and they're so overburdened and we need to add more bureaucracy to it. So. And the structural difficulties feed the size issue. Um, one of the statistics we talk about a lot at NCLA, and it's an older statistic, 
but I think it still rings true, is at least on the federal level, you're 10 times more likely to end up in an administrative hearing than you are in federal court. Roughly speaking, there's about 90,000 federal cases every year, about 900,000 administrative processes that go forward. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that when we look at it and say, well, who's hearing those processes? Is it a hearing officer? Is it an administrative law judge? Um, do they have the proper constitutional legislative authority to do that? And you can see how the size and the structure start morphing together to create these very serious constitutional problems. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's well said, Karen. Um, and, right, and, and you know, um, President Trump issued an executive order uh, last year to, to um, try to rein in the, the whole issue of guidance documents. And um, I, I guess we should say for, for guidance documents, these, what we're talking about are publications put out by, of various forms. It could be letters or pamphlets, um, um, brochures that are, that are put out by the, the various agencies. Um, and part of their um, motivation sometimes I think is to clarify things um, but maybe I think sometimes too, it, it really um, is, is a way to condition behavior without going through the rulemaking process. Um, and and in the, one of the problems, or one of the other problems with it, that guidance documents, or this practice of guidance documents was there was no central place that, that people could go and look to see what guidance documents would be would be governing the, the behavior they were interested in. Um, and, and there wasn't even, even, even the agencies uh, didn't have a handle on that. So the, the Trump administration issued a couple of executive orders um, to try to rein in that process, requiring things that they, that all the guidance documents be put up on a, on a public, publicly searchable um, webpage um, and, and that they all be cataloged and, and that, that certain procedural um, requirements be attached to them if they were going to have force of law. Uh, do, uh, I guess, start with, with you, uh, Anthony. Uh, do, do you have any sense as to whether or not these executive orders will remain in place under a Biden um, administration? Are these just a matter of good governance? Or is will there be some sort of um, pushback from from Biden administration? Yeah, thanks, Emma. I, I think you know to a, to a pretty significant extent, you know, the orders were. I mean, they did a, they did a number of things. Some of the what I think are the are the most important features. I think were to some extent, um, you know, it's not codifying, but putting in an EO the best version of the practices that are already in place. So for example, you know, uh, the order, the order requires that significant guidance go through effectively the notice and comment process, propose it, ask the, say to the public, this is what we're thinking. Tell us if we got it right, give us better data, science, evidence, analysis, so that we can make the most well-informed decision possible. Then the agency considers it and writes a final rule. That putting that in an executive order, I think is absolutely very, very important. We, we want that. We want more public engagement on, on new standards. We don't want, part of this is we don't want, you know, sort of edicts flying out, right, that without any kind of consultation with the public uh, in a transparent way. So that that's in the executive order doesn't mean that that's the first time that's ever happened. That actually happens, ha happened already in lots of places around the government. Uh, including in the Obama administration and, and prior to that, it happened a lot more in the Trump administration. And this is really saying, this is how we really want to do this going forward. We really want to commit to doing this more in a more fulsome way. I certainly hope that in some form that that provision stays, right? Uh, uh, whether they keep the executive order, that's just so important. And I think as a, as a very, I mean, the executive orders are in many respects, apolitical. I mean, they're not about achieving a particular partisan end. In fact, it's sort of, they repeat 
the principles of the Administrative Procedure Act up front, that's the lead, right? We want fair notice and due process, transparency, public engagement. These are not, you know, particularly political uh, aims. Um, uh, so I think that in some form they'll survive. I hope the orders do. Uh, I think there's every reason that they should. Um, they're anchored in Executive Order 12866 from President Bill Clinton. I mean, there's plenty of reason to think these are great uh, and should stick around. Um, but I do think even if they happen to go away, key features of them will remain. You know, are they, are agencies going to take down the guidance portals? I mean, that seems, I, I don't understand what the point of that would be. I mean, they're, 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 they're it's a useful transparency, one-stop shop for the public. It's something that people on both sides of the aisle have talked about for a long time, some permutation of that. Um, so I expect that we'll see some version of these. Um, they're, again, they're not terribly political, so. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I tend to agree. NCLA actually, over the course of about a year and a half, had um, submitted about 20 petitions for rulemaking, um, and this predates Executive Order 13891, um, petitions for rulemaking, seeking very similar to what the executive orders ultimately did about restraining guidance, about making it clear that guidance doesn't have the force and effect of law. Um, because, you know, we've seen it, I even have cases where, that are still outstanding, where the enforcement agency says, well, they didn't follow the guidance. And our answer remains, well, the guidance isn't law. And then the agency comes back and says, well, no, we, we know it's not law, but also they didn't follow it. And, I, you know, so there's still a disconnect, at least uh, in enforcement of these things, where the agency on one side can say, we know it's not law, but you should have done it. Um, and they're in court telling the court that, that very much feels like it's a binding edict from um, the agency in question. Um, so we are very pleased to see them come out. One of the issues that we talk a lot about with guidance um, is a finality issue. You know, when the agency issues guidance and we get challenged under the APA, um, it will go up to the courts on review and the court would say, well, it's not a final rule. Um, it hasn't gone through notice and comment. It's not really final. We under the APA can't do anything about that. So you end up with a lot of regulated entities who are sort of in, in administrative purgatory, for lack of a better term, that they couldn't get any relief from the court because the court didn't view the guidance as final, but the agency was enforcing it as though it were. Um, so, so that's something that, you know, we think in guidance is, is getting resolved a little bit. It's not 100%. Um, as the agencies were issuing their rules in relation to 13891, um, we had noticed that while you could petition for a withdrawal of guidance, there's no mechanism to challenge that. So um, myself and some of my colleagues have been sending letters and comments saying, hey, you know, when you issue the final rule, we think it would be really valuable to at least have a judicial review component of this, saying if you decide to retain a guidance, and we think it should be withdrawn that the regulated entities can have some recourse in the courts. Um, so that's that's something that we're actually currently working on. Well, this might be a good uh, segue to Fulton v. City of Philadelphia. Um, and for our audience, uh, I'll tell you uh, that Kara and her team filed, filed a brief in that case uh, and and they had some very, very interesting, uh, strong arguments uh, on the uh, administrative state in that brief. Um, there was a, huh, shoot, there was a, a question one of our participants um, had posted and now he's taken it down, but I'll, I'll read it, I'll, I'll recite it from memory. Um, so somebody had, and, and I'd just like you to, to think about this uh, as, as we're discussing Kara's case, someone had sent in a question and, and said, well, there's, there's uh, an idea floating out there in circulating in some Catholic circles that a strong administrative state might actually be good um, for, for Catholic doctrine, um, because if we had a, a strong administrative state and then we got a, a lot of um, uh, strong Catholics and Christians in there, uh, then the, the administrative state could actually 
um, put in a lot of good rules and shape society that way. Uh, so wouldn't that be a good thing? Uh, so it's a, assuming that that they could actually uh, fill up the ranks of the administrative state with with uh, people of that sort. Um, he's wondering, well, then could could good come from that? Um, I think that is, is, is really something to keep in mind uh, because I think your brief in Fulton v. City of Philadelphia sheds a lot of light on that thought. Um, I'll give a quick rundown on that case. In, in Philadelphia, all foster care placements are controlled by the city, which operates through placement agencies with an, an array of over 30 private foster care agencies. So when a, a family wants to care for a child, taking a foster child, it selects one of these agencies and the agency will conduct its own, um, own home study of whether to, to certify the family as being able to provide the care. Um, if one of those agencies certifies a, a family, then the city decides whether to place children in, in that family's home. The Catholic, service, Catholic Social Services in Philadelphia is one of those agencies, and it acts according to Catholic beliefs, including its belief, uh, beliefs about sex and marriage. Uh, therefore, it does not provide home studies or endorsements, um, theoretically, for unmarried heterosexual couples or same-sex couples. Catholic Social Services would instead refer those couples to other agency, uh, to another agency. But the, the thing is, no same-sex couple ever approached Catholic Social Services. Um, but after a newspaper questioned Catholic Social Services about its beliefs and, and published on that, Philadelphia cut off uh, foster care referrals to the agency. Uh, so, Kara, in, in, with, with that in mind, could you uh, talk to us about the, the brief you all filed? Sure. So, um, when that case went up on petition, it would actually certify what we call two questions presented. So, for the non-lawyers there, when you when you apply um, a petition for writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court, you very cleanly say these are the questions we'd like the court to resolve. Um, there may be ancillary issues, but mostly you're you're giving them the roadmap of the the questions you want answered. Um, and in the case of Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, there were two questions. One was um, whether free exercise plaintiffs can only succeed by proving a particular type of discrimination claim, namely that the government would allow some, the same conduct by someone who held different religious views, or whether courts must consider other evidence that a law is not neutral and generally applicable. And that's a, that's a current circuit split in how the courts are treating it. The second question is whether a case called Employment Division v. Smith should be revisited um, An Employment Division v. Smith is a case from 1990, and the general holding of it is that neutral laws of general applicability do not burden free exercise whether or not they're supported by a compelling interest. Um, we at NCLA only responded to the uh, first question, and a lot of our focus was on the bigger question of sort of looking at bureaucracies and administrative power and, you know, this sort of misconception of can you have neutral administrative practices? And we tended to fall on this Professor Hamburger, um, who is the president and founder of NCLA, has written extensively on, on religious exercise um, and helped draft this brief. And he's always come on the side of, and I, and I obviously agree with him because I was on the brief with him, that if you look historically at the way administrative and free exercise practices have developed in this country, there is either an issue of sort of inherent anti-religious bias or, you know, as Emma talked a little bit about this kind of development in the administrative state, the Woodrow Wilson kind of ideas of creating a science-based um, administrative knowledge class, if you will, um, which I think always has some sort of, again, anti-religious or a-religious bias, whatever it may be. I'm not necessarily willing to always say that everybody in that mix is some nefarious anti-religious purpose, but it may also just be the trade-off between science and religion, creating an a-religious preference. 
Um, and so one of the things we talk about is, well, you can talk about equal or, or, or neutral administrative processes, but the new, if the administrative processes aren't neutral because of the inherent sort of baked in anti-religious bias, then there's a problem. Um, and that's what the thrust of our brief is. There's facts in the record um, of anti-Catholic sentiment um, that was stated by members of throughout the administrative processes. And it's, it's that sort of snide side comment that, you know, really makes you think as you're going through the process that this process is never going to be fair to me, right? It's never going to be neutral to me because the people that I'm facing have already decided based on my religious preference, my religious practice, that they're unwilling or unable to sort of do the, the neutral analysis that that's warranted. Um, one of the things we do talk about is um, the, the history and development of free exercise to an extent has always been with an anti-Catholic lean. Um, some of the driving forces of free exercise and the early free exercise cases or the development of administrative state that's a religious or with an eye to anti-Catholicism. Um, this is very clear from some of Woodrow Wilson's writings who would refer to the Irishman, which I think we can all sort of understand is a sentiment towards Catholics. Um, and, and that's problematic, right? That these sort of structures to facilitate executive branch action have built into them anti-Catholic, anti-religious bias. And I think that that's become clearer over time where preference for secular behavior um, or, or secular views has sort of taken over. And I think that there's there's been a toning down or, you know, toning down is the word, but it, I don't want to say subversion either. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the preference for secular or, or secular popular views um, are ending up pushing down religious practices. And I think that that's something that's happening here. I think that that was something that was evident um, in the Fulton oral argument about concerns about LG LGBTQ families um, who may get shut out as a result of allowing Catholic social services to prevail. Um, but as Emmett said, there was actually no history in the record, no evidence in the record that a single family had ever sought to be certified by Catholic Social Services or been denied certification by them. It was just that they said affirmatively, we will not do this, we cannot do this because of our religious practice. Um, so I think that that's one of the issues. Listening to the oral argument, um, it was about two hours, which is a little bit on the long side for a Supreme Court oral argument, um, but they did let the United States argue as well. Um, I think the court's sympathetic to Catholic social services. I'm not convinced this is going to be a sweeping um, religious rights case. I don't think, you know, I think that there's a concern that um, it'll upend everything. I think that you're going to see um, something that's a little bit softer. Um, maybe comes out in CSS's favor, but doesn't really rewrite how we do free exercise cases in this country. Emma, we can't hear you. Sorry, Anthony, uh, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, thanks. I was just going to say also that, um, you know, sort of from a practical standpoint, for there to be uh, action within the executive branch uh, of a regulatory nature, you have to have a tremendous amount of coordination and a, a tremendous number of individuals and agencies and components of the government discussing and being in agreement to move forward with the policy. And so when we have, you know, the, the idea that you could sort of just get a few people in here or there and then those people could, you know, do something. I mean, that's, it's, a, it is a, it's an important idea, I think, of having, you know, new people, young people go and join government and, and uh, work toward, you know, uh, toward you know advancing the best policies possible uh but it takes you know over the, like let's say let's say you know you thought that you know some of the policies that have come out over the last you know four years have been good 
you know, th those have happened, uh, and not because the administrative state is so, you know, wonderful, but because they're, they're we, we, you know, you're able to have be in a situation where we had a number of great people across multiple components who worked together. Uh, and in many cases, you know, press reports that, you know, a lot of those things went up to the president himself and he made those decisions, right? Uh, so it really takes a lot of coordinated action to get those kind of results. Uh, and it is not easy and it is not common. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not the sort of, you know, state of nature for, for the administrative state to, to produce those kind of results. It's sort of like, you know, almost aberrational, right? I mean, it's great, but it's not that common. Yeah, so I, I would say, I'll, I'll read off the question. I found it, um, and to, to give it a, its full due. Um, so the question is, some Catholic legal scholars have argued that the rise of the administrative state is providential, as it may be turned, uh, through essentially a strategic infiltration of administrative positions to natural law purposes constant with Catholic social teaching and thus contribute to greater human flourishing. How might your panelists respond to these ideas? Um, so I, you know, I, I think there's, there's a couple of points here. And I mean, one of the things is, as Kara was talking about and, and as NCLA talks about in, in its brief is that through the administrative state, the, the relationship between, between citizen and government is, is qualitatively different. When, when citizens are, when, when, the, when the policy is being shaped by the legislature, um, the, the citizens have a sort of have a, a say in what's being done. And, and the legislature knows it has to listen to the citizens. Legislators know that, that the citizens um, uh, elect them, and and they know that that citizens have this um, have uh, religious uh, freedom concerns, among other things. Um, and that's always in the back of their mind, and they're always trying to accommodate that, uh, and they know they need to accommodate that, um, but. When, when the legislature gives power to, to the administrative state, it gives really just a, a finite set of, essentially a, a finite set of instructions, or it tries to. Um, nowhere in those instructions are concerns about, about um, the practice of religion, the free exercise of religion, uh, number one. But, and two, even if there, even if there were um, elements in there about that, uh, you still don't have that relationship uh, between uh, the same relationship between the citizen and the bureaucrat that you have between the legislator and the citizen. Well, and I, building on that, Emma, I think you know that's exactly correct because one of the things that you talk about is the sort of political consequences that remain in the political branches. The, executive insofar as the president is politically responsible to the people and the legislature, right? I mean, and so I can call up my congressman. I can't call up the head of HHS. I mean, I, I could try, um, but it's probably going to go nowhere. Um, I can comment on a rule that's pending, but if the issue in, say, like with, in the Fulton case is an issue of whether you want to call it um, licensing or government contracting or certification, then that's something that's a process that works inter internally within the administration itself. My only recourse is to work the process within that administrative unit. And then if, I, if I'm fortunate to get to the end and still have fight in me and I'm not happy with the outcome, then I can go to court. Um, what we see a lot of time too is that pushing back against that administrative force is like holding back a wall of water. You just can't do it. Um, and, and it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of money. And a lot of folks just get defeated before they ever get to that end result that's appealable to an independent Article Three court. So, you know, I think that that sensitivity, that political sensitivity that exists for religious Americans is important as an answer to the question. I think the other sort of two things that I would have concerns about are what I already talked about 
originally is that at least amongst the bureaucracy, there's this preference towards science and a and a religious behavior. And, you know, in hiring decisions, I think people hire people that are like them, that think like them. So there's sort of a practical thing of how would you even get sort of folks who are, say, more Catholic, more Christian, whatever, hired and into government. And then the, the other issue I would say is, and this is where I come from when we talk about non-delegation and other considerations, is the, the thing that you do not want, because just because I always say this, and it comes up in, in many instances, just because you like the outcome or it's your team that's doing it, um, doesn't make it right, doesn't make it lawful. And by the way, always be mindful that the other side can do it too. So this idea that you could just sort of stack the deck of a bureaucracy with folks who are more sensitive to religious concerns doesn't fix the problem, that the agencies don't have the delegated ability to write the rules that you're seeking and also stacking the deck in that way can also go in the other direction. Um, and I think that that's just something to be sensitive to because I don't think the answer is, well, we just get more people in. I think you can have greater conversations, you can have greater sort of involvement at the rulemaking process, but I do think that the legislative process um, and voting is really sort of for religious people right now is still the main way to be involved, to make their voice heard, to make sure that they're not having their rights trampled on. That's, that's well said. And, and um, you know, I, we, we talked about Tocqueville earlier, um, and, and I think that's, that's relevant here. You know, the, the, the question has to do with, um, with natural law. Uh, in, in a couple, a couple of points. I mean, we know when when an edict comes through administrative action that causes alienation. Um, it, it, people feel that that's not something of their doing. Um, I think they're they're less concerned when when it's a law that was passed by the legislature. Even if they don't agree with it, they at least understand the process and they at least understand. Yeah, hey, the problem is you know, I, I have a bad senator, or there's a bunch of bad senators, or by bad, I mean, you know, senators I don't like, and, and they gave us this law, and we have to change that. When it comes from the administrative state, those aren't people that we directly had a hand in, in putting into office, and, and so I think that causes alienation. Um, the, the other thing is, it, to, to go back to the, the question, too, um, if you're talking about the the natural law, um, and you, you could go back and, and look at this uh, through political philosophy or or through biblical teachings, and and um, but but let's do that. I mean, the the idea of of Christian theology and and is that that God gave. Um, man, um, charged man with exercising dominion over the earth. Um, and, and that included recognizing the freedom of other people to act in the work, to act um, on, on, on earth. Um, and what that means though, is he's, he's really charged us with working with other people to, to bring dominion to the earth. We can't do it autocratically. We can't do it on our own, and we can't do it uh, to the exclusion of other people. So it's really a charge that that we have to work as as a community to form the type of, of society that is good and just. Uh, and that's that's consistent with Tocqueville. Tocqueville right had those ideas that that it, it's um, people participating in shaping their society that leads to cohesion and, and will ultimately lead to, to just decisions. Um, Anthony, it looks like you have a, a comment on, along those lines. Yeah, thank, I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think, um, uh, you know, it's a very, what, what's happened is, you know, the, administ the uh, executive branch has uh, been delegated tremendous, you know, effect was effectively lawmaking power from, from the Congress. And so, um, you know, they, they can exercise that 
you know, in any number of directions using any number of instruments uh, to guide them. And that absolutely, you know, can lead to, uh, uh, to alienation and to those problems that you identified. And I think that's where, you know, things like the APA are supposed, are trying to draw it back to what, it, you know, uh, to being more in the nature of legislation through Congress uh, that is more participatory for the public, um, but they're, they're imperfect solutions. So I, I mentioned uh, uh, earlier that I think one of the, one of the, you know, challenges with the view uh, presented in the question is that, you know, it's very difficult to get all the people in all the right places to make, you know, to achieve these objectives. The other, the other big challenge I think is, is that delegation problem is, it, is people have been delegated discretion to do what they think is appropriate. So they can go in lots of different directions. Um, that's, that's, that's a lot to hand over. Um, uh, but I would at the same time say that in many respects, you know, this is the world we live in and this is the world we're going to live in for a very likely a very long time. And so I wouldn't hold this up as a, you know, as a great, you know, accomplishment or something to be celebrated. But I would say this is, this is, you know, or to get back to what I've said at the very beginning, this is the real world that we live in. And if we want to achieve, you know, uh, gains, we're going to have to lean in and do these very nitty gritty uh, things like filing comments, like, you know, reviewing new information collections when they come out uh, and seeing where the problems are, submitting comments on those, uh, focusing on the economic analysis, focusing, focusing on the scientific underpinnings, uh, you know, bringing lawsuits, doing all these things, ha you know, we have to do these things. This is, these are essential to, to victory, uh, in the in the short, medium, and long term, as far as I'm concerned, and so I, I hope that you know everyone will sort of you know list, lean in into that, and, uh, and again, especially for younger people trying to decide you know what to do, I, I I ask them to you know really you know become an expert in your craft. I think we're all lawyers here on the panel, right? But you know whether you're a lawyer, you're an economist, uh, some other area of policy, science, you know, lean in. Uh, develop that expertise and go, you know, use it uh, for good in the process. I mean, it, it has to happen. We have a, a practical and I think I, think, uh, I want to build something on what Anthony was saying towards the end of, you know, for those who are younger and looking at your career, I think one of the other things to do, and I, it, it struck me as something that's come through my mind often, I think, is we end up in a more polarized situation where we talk about difficult issues. I mean, like we said, full obesity of Philadelphia is a difficult issue. It's the difference, and, and the justices ask these questions. Free exercise versus sort of the autonomy of LGBTQ families to sort of operate in a way that, and the Catholic Church is human dignity, respect their dignity as a human. Um, and we often tend to see in our polarized world that we assume that those two forces are fighting against each other. As Emmett said, one thing to the exclusion of another. Um, but I think that the sort of input of compassion in the way you go about your work and the way you go about your life and taking time to understand there's both sides and to create a harmony between those two things, I think has real value because I do think it's been lost a lot probably in the past 10 to 15 years um, in the conversations that we've been seeing things as everything's one, this or that. And I think that most of our most folks don't live their life in that black and white. We live in shades of gray. And policy, for whatever reason, seems to have not adopted that same sort of concept. And I just think that, you know, as folks are going out in the world or they're practicing, you know, I think practicing compassion, practicing putting yourself in the place of the other side and understanding them, it's something that we as lawyers do. It makes us better at arguing. Um, but I do think that from sort of thinking through how to create sort of the ideas that the church has put forth that's a helpful way of, of proceeding in the world. So the a practical question, what would the panelists suggest instead of the administrative state? Uh, would, would it be better to abolish the agencies that make up the administrative straight, uh, state or just better to restrict them in some way? I, I think uh, the horse is so far out of the barn right now that you could never abolish them. I know there are folks that will push for that. 
Um, but I think that effective restrictions, um, we sort of touched on this a little, I think a reinvigoration, the non-delegation doctrine that actually means something um, and that the agencies actually adhere to would be incredibly valuable. Um, some of the justices have expressed interest in that. Uh, we have not gotten a case that actually has um, revived it in the way that I think some practitioners like myself would like to see. Um, but right now, you know, the, the agencies get away with a lot. And uh, most of the time, it's stuff that they were never delegated the authority to do. So even just returning to the structure that's set out in the Constitution would be a big step forward to, I think, mitigating a lot of these problems. Well, what would you do with administrative law judges and administrative hearings? <laughs> But that's the million dollar question. No, I mean, I think that there, there is potentially a way to structure administrative law judges that it doesn't violate the constitution. I think we haven't figured that out yet. Um, but one of the things that, you know, we always talk about at NCLA, a concern with the administrative law judge is that you end up in a, in a situation where if you're in an article three court, you're the prosecution, you the defendant and an independent judge, right? So that protects due process rights and other considerations it's really hard to go through an administrative law process within an agency where the agency is both the prosecutor and the executioner. Um, so until that issue is resolved, that administrative law judges um, sort of are party to the agency, I, I don't think that that's, that's necessarily gonna alleviate the issues. I mean, I, my preference is always to litigate in federal court when it's against an agency as opposed to the administrative process. Mm -hmm. um, so an another question, uh, consistent with the non-delegation doctrine, how many of the problems of the administrative state could be resolved by splitting it up so that its rulemaking functions are done by agencies under Congress, creating new agencies like the CBO and its adjudicating functions are done by specialized Article three courts. Well, I'd say, uh, I'd say that I think the, um, I think one of the main challenges, as Kara mentioned, is, you know, sort of over delegation to the agencies. So does that, does the delegation problem get solved if you move, move the agency from one article to the, another, you know, or a core function of it from one article to another? I'm not sure that, I mean, it, theoretically it, it does because it's then within the same article. So you're not really, I mean, you're only delegating it further down in the same article, but, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't change the, uh, the issue of the agency exercising discretion, right, and being able to come up with whatever inputs it wants to exercise, not what it wants, within the bounds of, you know, what we have in statute and, and, uh, and case law and, and the like, but basically a wide range of inputs for figuring out how to exercise that discretion. I think the real issue is narrowing the, uh, narrowing the delegations. Um, and this is where I think, you know, most of the attention is on Article 3. We're trying to, you know, push on the deference doctrines. And, and I think that that's really important. But there are two other articles that have a really important role to play in fixing the delegation problem. Congress could do this directly uh, by modifying these delegations. So, you know, I, I guess... Kara said a lot of the actions that happen are, you know, they're not pursuant to any, you know, grant of discretion. What I've seen is a lot of them are pursuant to very broad grants of discretion. So no, there are no like explicit call to direct something thusly, but, you know, a general rulemaking authority is cited as the, as the, um, the power, you know, for, for the rule. Uh, and that's it's those kinds of areas where I think Congress could really be a lot more, a lot clearer uh, uh, and more granular on ha on how what what authority they're giving the agency. Does it need to be that broad? Should it only be that broad in the case of you know a pandemic or some national security emergency or something like that? I think concrete steps to narrow the delegations both in the executive and legislative. The executive branch could, could likewise say, thank you for this you know, grant of, of authority. We, we don't want it, right? Uh, take it back. Um, we're not, we choose not to exercise it, right? And develop a, a, 
you know, a practice of operating that way. I think there, there really should be a lot more focus there. Um, I'm not so sure that just, you know, moving it into directly under Congress is really going to solve what I see as a key problem, which is just sort of being able to, you know, chain, go off in different directions on policy every four years or eight years. I mean, I just think that's not, I guess it would change a little bit if, if it's under Congress and not a president and it doesn't change with the administration, but I don't think that, I don't see it solving that delegation problem the same way. I don't care if you have other thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, uh, I think we're seeing the same way, at least a little bit different. Where I see, when I see very broad delegations, I tend to refer them as no delegation. Um, <laughs> because it, it's just so broad that this sort of concept of the intelligible principle is a stretch beyond a stretch. I've only actually ever seen once or twice um, cases where there was legitimately no delegation. So those are, the no delegation cases are, are somewhat rare, but the, to the extent that something is so broad, it also equals no, I mean, that's, that's what we see a lot of the time. But I do agree, I, I think that, and this goes back to the idea of political accountability is that if people are frustrated by the administrative state, then the answer is to get involved and write comments to regulations really it's to, to engage with the political branches and, and let them know we expect more. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that you look at, I always use as a classic example of, you know, the Affordable Care Act, for as many thousands of pages as it was, it 10 or 100 times that in terms of regulations. And, and Congress has been okay with that sort of behavior for decades now. Um, and that's, that's, I think, a byproduct of these broad delegations and of the fact that the courts haven't necessarily been willing to rein those in, um, to read in delegated powers under these, these broad standards where there really sort of isn't anything or if it's, it's a little untethered. Um, and I think that that's a problem. And the way to fix that is to elect individuals who are more accountable and are willing to do the work and get bills passed that actually articulate delegation and articulate structure of what the executive agency should be enforcing. Really, and that gets back to the idea of citizen action, citizen involvement. And one of the, one of the tragedies of the administrative state is it disengages people from being involved in, in governing society or even their communities. Uh, people tend to to draw um, to withdraw and look inward and, and just be concerned about themselves and and their families, um, and and so the the solution that so we're we're sort of encouraged or incentivized to do that, and and the solution is to to act against that incentivization um, and and to really act uh, willfully for for. Uh, the common good and a higher purpose, despite the incentives. Um, the the idea with the with the founding is that people would be. It was all built on the idea that that people would be involved in shaping their society and and they would have incentive to do it because they would they would be exercising power. They would actually be creating something, and in in the process of of that, they'd be forming bonds with their fellow citizens. Um, We've sort of interrupted that now. We're not forming bonds with our fellow citizens, um, on and on one hand, and and we're looking inward and and disengaging even in from even having an interest in where society is going. Uh, so we're step by step uh, becoming more like like uh, sheep, just being guided around. Um, and, and so it's, uh, I think that's sort of the, the real difficult hurdle that we have to overcome. And I, I guess going back to that first question, I think that's the real danger of that is, is regardless of who is staffing the administrative state, um, that's going to be the incentive is to, to go toward that radical individualism, to just be concerned about myself and, and my family and close friends that circle of people. Um, you're not drawn out to help other people, to, to form bonds with other people, or to work with other people in shaping society, and, and that's where bonds are formed. Um, so somehow it seems like we have to reverse this current, reverse the tide. Uh, 
So I guess that's what you're doing, right, Kara? And, and that's what you're doing, Anthony. That's what we hope to do. <laughs> so, well, thank you. Um, thank you, both of you. And thank you to, to all of our participants. And thank you for those great questions. Uh, this has been an exciting panel. And uh, it, wish, we wish you all the best. Um, so have a, have a great weekend. Thank you.